Hi, my name is Jody DeReal, and we are now in the live-in art studio of Joshua Peters. Today we're going to talk about his awesome large-scale art pieces, his amazing sneaker designs, as well as his radical ideas about the art world. You are now watching Profiles Cultural Renaissance. on uh, many times I'll start painting something and if if it's going well but the background doesn't have enough texture I might spray with a spray bottle and let it come down or um, there's a uh, painting I have in here this Bo Jackson painting it's a woman as Bo Jackson with a, um, a Nike ad sort of thing with the football pads and the baseball bat she and I had a real argument while I was making that painting and I painted out huge sections of it ruined it X'd it out. 50% of the painting was gone. And then rekindled it. But it, it sort of helped me re-enter the painting. So it's not accidental, but I'm not trying to control that other half of it. Does, does that answer no, that, the question? No, that answers my question perfectly. Because um, I have experience with that as well. But like, I, like we were discussing earlier, I'm so much more like... I don't know, I'm too much in my head sometimes, I feel like. I feel like everybody, the grass is always greener. Mm -hmm. I could learn to be tighter. You probably then could learn to be looser. Yeah. And like somewhere in the middle is probably the best work for both of us, but it's not going to be at the same level of looseness or tightness, and that will change over time. Right. Like this thing's all a flow. But let's check out the artwork in the living room over here as well. So I have um, a couple things in here. This, mm -hmm. is a, this is a really old painting. This is actually graduate school work. I was shooting photography at a, a Martin Luther King March in Denver, and I happened to catch, or this man happened to catch me photographing him mm -hmm. with his son, and the thought process behind this uh, was simply, in the context and the racial constructs that we deal with in the United States specifically, that this man is going to explain how that young boy, his son, is going to have to navigate the world. Mm -hmm. and like. It, it was problematic for me. Um, it, it, like I put it into this context with this uh, Confederate flag to kind of deal with that. Um, some of the underpainting is a real good green sewage color, so there's an insidiousness that's like you know apparent. Um, and there I ask, how long did this take? This is back in the old oil days of grad school, so I want to say this probably was a 20-hour painting, uh, multiple sittings with oil. But you know the stenciling was probably all done in one shot. The 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 faces were five or six sittings, but what was really important was to set this cross mm -hmm. on his shoulder like he's carrying the cross. Oh, I see that. that so is this is called okay. father and child, and you see a lot of mother and child. Yeah. And you also have many times, of, you know, you know, sort of the mythology of the absent black father. Um, that's not an easy job. It's not an easy job to be a black mother or a single black mother or any of those other things. But there are black fathers out there, and so I was just sort of highlighting that. And, speaking to issues of, of race and religion and so on. Um, so you were describing your tattoos. Yeah, I got a few. Would you, dis would you say that your body is a canvas? Are you looking to fill up everything? Or, and what do you have currently on your body? That Thor's hammer is a cover up. Okay. There was like a, a man, like a little hip hop dude mm -hmm. that was underneath there. And I got this to commemorate my big show in 2007 at Quarter Gallery. Um, Danny Sims gave me the opportunity to be in a group show and I had 13 superheroes, so I got this. Um, 
This is Invictus, my weightlifting club in Queens. Mm -hmm. That's uh, my coach's team name, no longer is that name, but still the old plate. That was my first team in New York. Thomas Hart Benson is one of my favorite uh, uh, painters. He taught Jackson Pollock how to paint. He's part of the WPA administration. You can find murals of his in Manhattan in Midtown. That is a sliver, those three figures going down that way yeah. under the Peters. The Peters was uh, put on my back first as an outline. It would never be filled. My entire back would be filled. Right. So when the back is full, it'll look like a jersey. You'll be able to read my back from, oh. from you know, 500 feet, 800 feet. Um, my father, when my grandfather was getting ready to pass, did not have me, did not make it possible for me to come down and see him. He went by himself, and because I don't drive, I can't go to Florida by myself, so I never got to see him. Then he passed, and then I didn't even get to go to the funeral. So I put my family name on my back as a result, and as a joke, I did it in the Star Wars form. So the other pieces, this was for my big show, uh, again with Danny Simmons at Brush Arts. Uh, I did a huge Uncle Sam painting with Danny, and I did this zombie Uncle Sam as sort of like a tip of the hat to that experience. And what else do I have back there? There's Prince, because Prince passed. Mm -hmm. This is the Freedom Duck. Yes. It is loosely based on Howard Duck and Nick Fury. Mm -hmm. And the Freedom Duck was put there when I did my best mural to date that is at Freedom Barbell Athletic Academy in Long Island. My friend Christian Harris, who you saw the portrait of in the living room. Uh, Christian um, commissioned me to do a Freedom painting and it's like in a Hulk font and has this huge eagle, eagle's eyes are like, you know, as big as my head. So that's why I have a Freedom Duck. And what else do we have left? Oh, this um, is a Fortune thing. Frog. Yeah. So this is a traditional, the only traditional Japanese uh, tattoo on my back. And he's spitting up gold coins towards yeah, my painting hand. Yeah. There'll be at least one more or two more coins that'll go down my arm, probably down to the bicep. Maybe down into the forearm. Mm -hmm. And that's just supposed to bring good luck and fortune. Because that was my next question. Because me, I have about eight tattoos. So the process, I know, is ridiculous. Um, have you been doing them individually, like you have different sessions, or um, do you do them in groups, like two today, or etc.? He did this one in two sittings. Okay. One was four and a half hours after the cover up in white. Mm -hmm. um, that I never have done since. So I've sat for three hours or less. I generally only go for an hour, an hour and a half now, because it, especially as it got closer to the spine, it got worse. Um, so spine is no joke. Spider one, there's another one going here. I've got a spider woman that's going to go here. Mm -hmm. That's going to be pretty bad. But then most of the spine is handled. I can do longer sessions after that, but everything by the spine is short. So how long um, would you left. say you have left? Oh, cool. This is my spirit animal. <laughs> I see, because you had the paper machine. Yeah, right I snatched 110 kilos, and my gift to myself for that was finally getting my spirit animal on my uh, shoulder. I think Chinese is how I remember it, but I'm not sure if that biography is true. You can check online. Albert Chong was a photography guy at my graduate school at the University of Colorado Boulder. This old dirty bastard always had a like, cadre of young white women chasing after him. And, and he liked that attention, and he was really rough on the white males. Anyway, especially me. So I took some nude photographs with my boy. And Albert Chung was like, God, he's got a little thing. Like, had that comment in the critique. I wasn't there to defend my thing. And it was cold that day. Anyway, so I made this painting as revenge. This is the, fir this is the first of two paintings that I ever hung in, in New York City. So thank you, Albert, for one, defaming me and telling everybody I had a little penis and giving me a complex, and two, for being an old dirty bastard. We love you, Albert <laughs> Chong. Very cool. So yeah, the other one was sold to an artist um, who has really done well for himself. The first artist to show me, first curator to show me in the city, Derek Adams. He's now part of Dean Collection. He's done things with Swiss Beats. He does performative things. He does great sculpture. He does pop-oriented things. He did like a Spelman College, like university store on the Lower East Side. It was epic. Anyway. Would you say like your work is very traditional or um, do you think you fall like, under a different category? Traditional in the sense that it's portraiture, sure. Traditional in its choice of colors or subject matter, absolutely not. So, so the fact that I liberally um, uh, have people of color throughout my work, mm -hmm. um, the fact that I have an issue with just painting female white nudes, like I can't do it. That is portraiture's tradition. 
that's what a a painter who does portraits or calls himself a portrait artist should do. I don't even do that. Um, I'm interested in the human condition in a modern sense and in the traditional sense. But I'm more interested in like representing like what I know and like how complex things are. Right. Things are too complex to just do them the way they normally do. So my references are pop cultural, my colors are more cultural, meaning uh, they're influenced by having grown up in Hawaii and, and the kind of music I listen to and the aesthetics that follow that kind of music. Um, so the, my answer is yes and no. No. <laughs> so somewhere in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, but let's talk about this piece because this piece I was, as soon as I walked in, I was amazed and then you said you finished it in like how, how long did it? It was six or seven days total. I had a visit with um, uh, my my college mentor. Actually, moved to New York, and he and his wife came over to see this this painting six days after it was a white canvas, or seven days after it was a white canvas. And I had another painting for them that's larger, that's yeah. in the stacks here, four days later. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, "Why are you going back? Why are you going?" He finished another. Wow. If people, meaning the, the fact that I have rent and you know, student loans to pay and taxes to pay. Exactly. If folks would get out of my way, I could make one of these every week easily for the rest of time. Wow. Easily. That's so, so you know, like the scale of it is part of it, but like yeah. to me, doing a painting that's doing a painting that's this small yeah. has as many strokes. Get some shine on that. Has as many strokes as this big thing. Okay. And as long as I have a place to house or a place to show something big like this, why wouldn't I make it big? I mean, there's a reason for intimacy with your images. I mean, mm -hmm. this is an intimate scale of portrait. Mm -hmm. But this is this is kind of how I prefer to work. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go look at my brushes? Yes, let's, let's look, look at the, look the brushes. brushes. Yeah. Let's look at the brushes. Let's look at some brushes. That'd be awesome. So this isn't the exhaustive brush palette. This is working 18 by 18 inches. Sorry, for the last few weeks, few like two months. So there are some small brushes in here, but generally I start with and use things that are this big, right. and I just switch. So I'm painting, or I'm painting, and how I load it depend, and how I lay it down is you know dependent on sort of how you hold a big brush rather than how you hold a little brush. Like, yeah. But I'm more comfortable with that. With that one. And these are cheap, by the way. I think I ruined this one. And where would you um, get something like that? This is, I'm. This is a red line brush. I'm pretty sure I ordered this one on Amazon. Okay. But I often will buy brushes, at, you know, cheap, cheaper brushes from um, Home Depot and saw off the end. And then I'm painting with fist. Mm. You know, monkey fisting. So there's, <laughs> there's more um, brushes. Acrylic paint, nonsense. There's more brushes under here. Oh wow. But like this. I paint with this, I paint with that, I paint with this, and this is, 75% of the painting happens with those. Mm -hmm. And then the little paintings, I will, the little paint brushes or paint strokes, the fine details, they'll work their way in, Yeah. but then I have to hammer over the top of it too, because like, there's a vocabulary, right? And, and like with food, there's like many, many flavors. Right. Strokes, there's many, many strokes, and you want to show the big ones, and you want them right next to small ones. And if they sit near each other, the same way if dark sits next to light, black there's sits next to white, it gives you contrast. Exactly. So when you go in with a small brush, especially if you choked it up to the to the front of it, mm -hmm. it's really controlled and it's stiff. Mm -hmm. It's traditional. Yeah. You want to get in touch with what your heart thinks. You go to the end of the brush. You go to your left hand. You go to your foot, yeah. and you're gonna get what. What I would call a more honest mark. That's it's not exactly fair, but like that's one of the ways I, that I'd express that. No, it makes An sense. It means like it's it's truly coming from the heart. Because me, like I I definitely would consider myself a very traditional. Like it's very rare that I've jumped out of the box and said screw everything, screw definitions, and and really went at it. So being in this space is, is really insp that. inspiring, especially what you that. just said. Um, so my next question is, do you have any pieces you're working on that are significant right now? I do. I just finished um, the first series. I'm working serially now. What I mean is I don't just make a painting. Mm -hmm. 
I make installation of two, three, four, five, six, nine paintings and put them together. They're meant to be hung together. Um, and I just finished one. There's five images, and it's it's about the Standing Rock um, uh, police brutality that that took place in Standing Rock, having to do with the uh, the no um, pipeline thing in the Dakotas, and which is not over. There was a march of indigenous people and for indigenous rights this week, last week in D.C. Uh, that shit ain't over at all. In 2003, 2004, I had a good friend of mine who was, you know, sort of did security and uh, like that kind of work. Knew a lot of rappers. He's like, these guys are buying all these custom sneakers. You need to stop painting canvases, paint these sneakers. And I was like, well, you know, it's a good idea, whatever, you know, whatever. And then I saw an article where some guy did like 20 pairs for Mace and they were like 350 a clip. And I was like, 350 a clip? I quit my job. <laughs> so, so I got on it. And, but my, my real goal at first was just to pay for my sneaker habit. And, and I wasn't moving a lot of them at first, but you know, I, I've become a little more successful and I've figured out a few more chemical processes and so on. But I've been doing it since 2004. And it pays for my entire art practice. So when I'm between commissions, or when I can't find buyers, or, or I don't have a show coming, I'm probably working on somebody's shoes. I actually, in 2016, I made no shoes for myself in 2016. I actually um, absorbed my Rick Grimes Walking Dead sneaker. Uh, I've worn them to Tokyo, uh, to the Harajuku district, because I wanted to be fly, mm -hmm. which is bad, because I sort of saved them to sell them or whatever. So I didn't make them for myself, but they were finished in 2016, and I wore them. But otherwise, I had too many client commissions to, to you know, make any for myself. Um, I'm into shoes, and I'm into fashion as a thing, and into like, I mean, it's sort of a DIY aesthetic to what I do, but at, you know, like, I don't make the most factory bought looking paint jobs. Like, I'm still gestural, it's still just, like, there's, there's a lot of carryover for how I paint on a canvas to how I paint on a shoe. And in fact, I've done so many shoes in the last three, four years that my canvas art uh, has been changing. I use stencils in a different way. I make marks in a different way. I went to a completely acrylic setup. Everything is in um, these little paint tubs, which is just like how my, um, my sneaker habit goes, yeah. This is a pink that I used for some frosting. It's kind of gross. Mm -hmm. Nice salmon-y color. But yeah, so so there's like a lot of carryover technically between the two. Um, I really have thought about um, stretching uh, leather, shoe leather, uh, and painting on it. And I have a cobbler I work with. I really want to cobble shoes now. Like I would like to design and do like a short run of boots twice a year, like boots in the winter, small sneaker in the summer. I want to make like like stitch make and paint on and affect my own sort of fashion six seven at a time all right so we've seen pretty much your artist space let's walk through the rest of the apartment which is pretty much like a gallery like let's leave okay. lead me through it so we're going into the hallway uh where this is sort of where i keep the uh the big work right I built tables so I could stack. This is exactly the size to get three by four foots, mm -hmm. and there's tons and tons and tons of them. So Small there, working bags. Are there any pieces that you didn't want to put out? So, everybody loves Tupac Shakur, right? And everybody should love uh, David LaChapelle, and if you don't, look him up. Mm -hmm. And they worked together once, and the people who know both of them, the, especially people who know David LaChapelle, will know the photograph that I'm referencing. Mm -hmm. I know that you probably do. Um, do you remember that photograph of Tupac in the bathtub with the mm -hmm. gold chain? Yeah. So, I, I remade that. I have this photographer buddy, he's brilliant, Mike Brown, he's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And um, he brought me over to his friend's house, they had a clawfoot tub, he got on a ladder and he took a picture of me with gold Lego. I'd spray painted like eight pounds of Lego, gold, and put it over my crotch. And was like, did all the poses that he did. <laughs> yeah. And like, I thought this was gonna be super dope and like kind of hard, you know? And he was like, nah, this is just like weird, like badger <laughs> porn. I was like, dude, what's a badger? And he's like, you know, like there's bears, they're like big gay guys. And you're like a half shaved little big man. So you're like a badger. I was like, what the f oh. So anyway, that hasn't seen the light yet. <laughs> so but that was you, um, pretending to be I was, Tupac? I was or, doing or my you Tupac were, Shakur, right. like whatever, but. I didn't, I didn't have as much ink then, Okay. And, and you know, I definitely didn't have any rap albums out at the time, uh, rap album on the way, 
Uh, but oh man, like they are really too sexy. Like they're so sexy, they're embarrassing. <laughs> All right, like, so, oof. so I guess staying on that path, um, do you have any work that, that are like sexually infused, like full on inspired by that? Um, I have avoided the erotic. Like I listen to a lot of Prince. Like in my spoken word, there was a lot of eroticism and so so forth. But especially because I come from an academic background, um, the the over sexualizing a woman's body or a man's body for that matter, like really tilts and skews the um, the re. Now I have actually planned a series that is, that I'm sort of like just getting my toe in the water, like testing the waters for um, that that is going to be a little bit hentai inspired, like the Japanese sort of anime porn. Um, I've done 2D, I've done comic book art, I've done like, you know, full portraits of people in different costumes and stuff like this, which is its own little fetish, I guess, but but nothing that's like super nudes or like lots of penises and breasts <laughs> and whatever, because that like usually, like it's, it's too easy. And it's, it's sort of, I think, required of me, my level of consciousness that like, I want a, a broad group to be able to see the work and enjoy the work. Now, do I want to do work that gooses people's expectations? Absolutely. Um, can there be work that's more sexual? Is that acceptable? I'm actually, at my age, I feel I can make that work. Um, but I was really hesitant to like dive into anything that, that would have me labeled right. as one of these, you know, um, like a certain type of artist, Yeah, like, right? you know, Jeff Koons has made, like, a bunch of photographs and sculptures of him having sex with his porn star wife. Now, he's part of the circus. Do the circus. I'm not going to do the circus. And I'm also not going to present straight porn as art. It can be done. Um, I haven't had a reason to do it. Yeah, so, so erotic, that makes sense. I'm into it, but yeah. more in my music than I am in my... Uh, because one artist that comes to mind, um, I was introduced to her during high school. Her name is Gada Amir. And she does pornographic images from like those magazines in the 80s. But sure. her reason is because she's a Muslim artist and her father had her tied down. So she's like freedom and porn and, and sex, etc. cetera. Um, so let's move on to the next question. I wanted to know, um, has anyone ever categorized you as not an artist? Like, do you think... Um, there are some people, I guess the haters, we will call them, yeah, who, sure. who, have, who have pointed the finger and said, hey, what you're doing is not art. I, I've been told in various fine art settings uh, that the quality of my work is low, uh, uh, so not an artist. I've, and that was during graduate school. Very specifically, I was told my work was barely student work. Um, but I paint in a gestural way, and I use color the way people use notes. And so if you're not like really musically inclined or into like what's modern music, into hip hop, into R&B and soul, you're not gonna understand my work anyway. You're not gonna get the colors. You know, it's not Mozart over here. Mozart's great, you could do that. I love things that have been painted to Mozart. I just don't make those. Um, so in that context, it's happened. Um, coming to New York, um, when you used to give things to people, this in 2002, this was still true, uh, the early 2000s, there used to be slides. Like, you know, slides of your work, you send them. If you send slides of your work and they're a bunch of superheroes and then they're projected on a screen, people go, oh, he's an illustrator, he's not an artist. Exactly. Because they see a difference between that versus art. Um, all those walls really came down in the, in the 60s and 70s. It's kind of over, like pop, post pop art. I mean, it's like you said before, um, the art world has come very, it has become very clicky. Sure.